ပါမိဆိုရင်အားလုံးခြေတော်နာမှတ်လဲမင်္ဂလာပါကောင်းကြီးအောက်ပြည်ကြီးပေါ်မှာအရေးကြီးတဲ့ကြေတင်ခြင
ชูตาบาดายกองสองดีปิญญาติอันนาตติเจนสิตะเนี่ยโกจิ้นไหนเนี่ยตูดิจิ้นนี่เนี่ยอจิ้นแท้ขมย้ายอจิ้นหาลอง
ตัวนั้นมวยกูเหี่ยวท้าตะเกซุลูดาดีเหี่ยวท้าเชิงกูขายาดีตะมะฮองกาลาดงกามอชิคิดอิตริลาลูเมียวจุมบวะกาเนข
ตุกยอทาบาเลยกะลาติตะอคันจิเนอเนสังกามาลูโดสิปิญญะตะยายอะจิตอาภิชอบมัตยาตุตะยอกูเยชุคริโกยงกิเชอาภิชอบมัตย
By my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in a reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. T. N. Wright, C. S. S. R., in a lecture at Hartford, Kansas, February 18, 1884. The Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Mirror, September 23, 1893. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Peter Geierman, The Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, 2nd edition, 1910, page 50. Question, have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Stephen Keenan, A Doctrinal Catechism, page 174. There is but one church on the face of the earth which has the power or claims power to make laws binding on the conscience, binding before God, binding under penalty of hell fire. For instance, the institution of Sunday. What right has any other church to keep this day? You answer by virtue of the third commandment. The papacy changed the fourth commandment and called it the third, which says, Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. But Sunday is not the Sabbath. Any schoolboy knows that Sunday is the first day of the week. I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who will prove by the Bible alone that Sunday is the day we are bound to keep, and no one has called for the money. It was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday, the seventh day, to Sunday, the first day of the week. T. Enright, CSSR, in a lecture delivered in 1893.
ကျွန်တော်ညတူကြောင့်ကြီးပေါ်နဲ့ရှိတော့မှုတော့ထောက်ရဖဖေရတခင်ကျွန်တော်ရတူကြောင့်ကြီးပေါ်နဲ့ရ
ไล่ล่ะจ้ะบ่เลยโดดๆเลยตรุนันดาซีมุ้ยโกปิ่นซินดอเลตรุอะดิเนตอกจานี่นิวินตั้วโลบ่เนาะนิวินตั้วโลต
ခုနေရတဲ့ပထမနေဖြစ်သောထိုနေနိုင်တယ်ညချင်ရောက်သောခါယူတာလူတို့ကိုကြောက်ယွေဒကားများကိုပိတ်ထားလေတပိတော်တ
to yana e mesii huye alang do go po be yama thavi go chi shu ja lo no ana chang yesu krit oha shin pyan tham myao de tham myao twa chang kong yi de man ga le di ma pyo de go pyo da go chan do chan sa aya twe shi ya ba de yesu krit oha shin pyan tham myao de ni ga อ่าปฐมานิยะเนาะปฐมานิยะจนเราคุขิกาละอะยะเปียกเดยมาจีมั้ยซุยเนาะตะนุกุนีนิဖြစ်ပါတယ်ตะนุกุนีนิหาคริ
ကောင်းကင်အမေဇီမြင်နေပြင်နိုင်ပြန်ဝဲတဲ့သောမိစ်မိတ်တော်မှုရှိသည့်အတိုင်းထိုးသို့ရေမြင်နိုင်သရိ
ကျန်းစာတွေရေးပြီးခဲ့ပါတယ်ဘာဖြစ်လို့လဲဆိုကျွန်တော်ဒီဥပုံနေနဲ့ပတ်သက်လို့အများသောအားဖြင့်ကျ
အသင်းဤသားတမိကျွန်ရောက်ကြာကျွန်မိမ်းမှာအတိုင်းဆန်အသင်းဤတကားတွေ့နိုင်နေသောဧဇေအာကာနှုအလုံးမလုံးရအက
ကျွန်တော်တို့နားမလဲတဲ့အခါမှာကျွန်တော်တို့ဟာအကိုစိတ်ကိုအရပြောတယ်လိုပဲထင်ကြတယ်သို့တော့ကျွန်တော်တို့
ကျွန်တော်တို့အနေနဲ့ဖျားသခင်ကိုယုံကြည်တယ်ဖျားသခင်ဟာကျွန်တော်တို့ကိုဖန်ဆင်းတော့အရှင်လို့တကယ်လို
ဒီမောဒီစာစံအခန်းကြီးနေငယ်ဆက်ချောက်ဒီမောဒီစာစံအခန်းကြီးနေငယ်ဆက်ချောက်ဘာပြောလဲဒီနေရာမှာကျွန
I have repeatedly offered one thousand dollars to anyone who can prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, No, by my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in a reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. T. Enright, CSSR, in a lecture at Hartford, Kansas, February 18, 1884. The Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Mirror, September 23, 1893. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Peter Geierman, The Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, 2nd edition, 1910, page 50. Question, have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Stephen Keenan, A Doctrinal Catechism, page 174. There is but one church on the face of the earth which has the power or claims power to make laws binding on the conscience, binding before God, binding under penalty of hell fire. For instance, the institution of Sunday. What right has any other church to keep this day? You answer by virtue of the third commandment. The papacy changed the fourth commandment and called it the third, which says, Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. But Sunday is not the Sabbath. Any schoolboy knows that Sunday is the first day of the week. I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who will prove by the Bible alone that Sunday is the day we are bound to keep, and no one has called for the money. It was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday, the seventh day, to Sunday, the first day of the week. T. Enright, CSSR, in a lecture delivered in 1893. ကျွန်တော်နောက်ဆုံးနေနဲ့မာလိုက်ရှင်နာကညီကိုမောနမမြန်တနုဂ္ဂနေနေဝိပြုကိုကွယ်ခြင်းဆိုတာကကျွန်
Pabida Lila Bida Janot Nale do she the Miago, Janot Cha Swamia we had up she bare, and a Nigo Monoma Miani, Pia the King Go Chi, Pia the King in Nao Dodo, Pia the King in Ubo Nigo, Sound Tenja Bazo. When was a Roman Catholic Church made? In order to understand its birth, first we need to follow the process on how the early church in Rome, which had been persecuted, obtained recognition from the Roman Empire. The church in Rome kept the undefiled truth of the early church in its initial stage, but later accepted various gods of Rome and religious customs when it became acknowledged as a Roman religion. And this gave birth to the Roman Catholic Church that has the characteristics of Roman polytheism. The Apostle Paul preached the Gospel of Christ to Palestine, Asia Minor, Greece, and finally in Rome. The church in Rome was not welcomed in its initial stage. It was because of the monotheism of Christianity and the polytheism of Rome conflicted with each other. The Romans believed that everything, humans, places and goods, was inhabited by divinity. As they accepted folk beliefs, of the people they conquered, far more various gods and religions prospered in Rome. Christian monotheism that appeared in this age went counter to the polytheistic concept of Rome, especially as the Roman emperors approved all the religions of the people they conquered in order to rule over them and to achieve their political purposes, this came into conflict with Christianity, so the Roman emperors persecuted the Christians. The early church was oppressed by many emperors, but there was a turning point during the reign of Emperor Constantine in the 3rd century. In 313, Emperor Constantine proclaimed the Edict of Milan. The Edict approved Christianity as a legal religion of Rome and gave legal privileges and immunity from military duty and taxes to the Christian clergy. There was the political goal of Constantine underlying such kinds of preferential treatment. It was Mithraism, the sun worship religion, that was diffused throughout Rome. But all the Roman emperors deified themselves and enforced people to worship them. Some of the nobility were fascinated by the Egyptian mystery religion. So, Rome suffered from religious dissension within itself. At this, Constantine tried to make the best use of Christianity that had spread throughout the whole region of Rome, despite all sorts of persecution. This was because he thought that Christianity could solidify his empire. By approving Christianity as a national religion of Rome, Constantine tried to seek the unity of the Roman Empire under one religion. Thanks to Constantine's pro-Christian policies, many believers of the polytheistic religions of Rome streamed into the Christian Church. This tightened Constantine's political grip, and Christianity positioned itself as the religion of Rome, expunging persecution and contempt it had received so far. 
However, the indiscreet conversion they did without having any kind of understanding or faith, rather, produced an adverse effect, the influx of pagan customs into the church. Those who were tainted with polytheism of Rome looked as if they had converted, but in actuality it wasn't easy for them to get rid of the religious rites and institutions of worshipping the sun, the moon and the stars, and various gods and goddesses, which they had worshipped since their forefathers. The church in Rome sought for solutions to disburden the pagans when they converted to Christianity. It was to bring in things similar to the gods that the pagans had believed into the church. They thought they would increase the number of pagan converts by doing that. For the Christian bishops introduced with but slight alterations into the Christian worship those rites and institutions by which formerly the Greeks and Romans and others had manifested their piety and reverence towards their imaginary deities, supposing that the people would more readily embrace Christianity if they perceived the rites handed down to them from their fathers, still existing unchanged among the Christians. The church in Rome that had been persecuted and despised wanted to put their roots down in Rome as an approved religion even if they had to be mixed up with Roman polytheism. It was because they wanted to keep their faith in comfort, being freed from the extreme pain of persecution. To attract more pagans, the church in Rome tried to Christianize various kinds of pagan gods to suit the Bible. One of the most representative things among them was accepting pagan customs of the sun god worship tradition. The church in Rome identified Jesus with the sun god. Inside of the church was decorated with various kinds of sun images and the idea to worship the sun was established as if it were the truth of the church. All judges, city people and craftsmen shall rest on the venerable day of the sun. Constantine's edict in 321 played an important role in making the sun god worship faith to put its roots down in the church. Constantine continued to identify the sun with the Christian god in some way. When in 321 Constantine made the first day of the week a holiday. He called it the Venerable Day of the Sun, Sunday. The Christian Church took over many pagan ideas and images. From sun worship, for example, came the celebration of Christ's birth on the 25th of December, the birthday of the sun. As the sun god worship mingled in with Christianity, the church in Rome was deprived of its purity of the early church and changed its appearance to the Roman Catholic Church.
Before the third century, the church in Rome was one of many churches that were scattered all over the Roman Empire. The reason the church in Rome later became the head of all the churches of the world and dominated the Middle Ages was because it joined hands with Emperor Constantine. As a result of Constantine's pro-Christian policies, many people who believed pagan gods converted to Christianity. This consolidated Constantine's political position and there was no need for the church in Rome to refuse the convert because it was a good opportunity to secure its religious position. After the church in Rome accepted pagan idolatry and doctrines, it was quickly secularized. During the Middle Ages, it was even hard to tell the difference between the church and the secular world. The Catholic Pope enthroned kings and kings protected the Catholic Church. Opposing the Catholic Church itself was rebelling against one's own country. The Pope wielded an absolute power. We can see just how powerful he was through one incident, the humiliation at Canossa. That happened during the time of Pope Gregory VII. Pope Gregory VII claimed that the Pope could not be judged by anyone on earth, and he could dethrone emperors and kings, and excommunicated Henry IV, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in the course of the investiture controversy. As Henry IV was faced with the crisis of being dethroned, he went to the Pope who was in Canossa. Barefoot, he knelt for three days in the snow outside the castle of the Pope and begged for his forgiveness. This is what is called the humiliation at Canossa incident. The Pope had so much authority that there was no one who was able to hold back the church from abusing its power anywhere in Europe. Not only that, the Popes committed numerous crimes such as murder, blasphemy, simony, and adultery to hold on to their seat of power. We cannot even fathom the evil deeds of the corrupt popes. Among them, 
Pope Leo X enjoyed works of art and collected masterpieces. He invited artists like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Raphael to the Vatican and richly ornamented the church. Being driven by his vanity, he constructed St. Peter's Basilica. However, as he ran out of money by collecting costly works of art, he started to print a greater amount of indulgences. An indulgence is a certificate giving the forgiveness of sins. The Catholic priest propagated that people were guaranteed to enter the kingdom of heaven safer when they gave more money. Come, see for yourself. This is not just a simple indulgence. Even though you don't do confession, all your sins will be forgiven. Even the sins of your relatives in purgatory will vanish. Will you just leave your mother to suffer in the fire? Come here, everyone. Come. When you drop the coins in the box and it makes a clinking sound, then the souls will arise from the fiery purgatory. The sale of indulgence was one of the biggest businesses of the Catholic Church. Since indulgences was a good solution for those who were seized by the fear of hell, numerous people gathered to buy the Kingdom of Heaven. Giotto, the representative artist during medieval Europe, clearly shows the evils of indulgence in his work. The Last Judgment. In the painting, Jesus, the judge, is in the middle and the apostles are on both sides. Heaven is shown on the right and hell is shown on the left. One thing that is worthy of notice here is the scene where souls are weighed. A man who is on his knees presents a model of the chapel to three women. The name of the man is Enrico Scorveni. He was a notorious loan shark of that time. Because loan sharking was a big sin, he could never dream of entering the kingdom of heaven. However, even though Enrico was a loan shark, he bought indulgences and paid for his sins and proudly purchased the ticket for the kingdom of heaven. The Bible teaches that only God can forgive sins. However, the Catholic Church insists that the Pope too has the authority to forgive sins. This kind of false teaching enabled them to commit fraud, the sale of indulgences. The Inquisition, run by the Catholic Church, is evidence that shows how corrupt and cruel the Catholic Church is. The Inquisition, which was established for religious trials, 
became a transnational institution of the Catholic Church. It was devised to condemn heretics designated by the Catholic Church. Heretics defined by the Catholic Church were the Christians who opposed the false insistence and doctrines of the Pope and wanted to live by the Bible. To rule over the world as they want. The Popes tried to get rid of the Bible and restricted people from reading it. Pope Alexander III labeled those who read the Bible as heretics and commanded to confine Christians who were condemned as heretics to expropriate their property. Pope Innocent III instituted the Inquisition and launched crusades to combat heresy. Numerous Christians were killed and dispossessed of their properties. Pope Gregory IX claimed to punish heretics who did not repent and appointed the order of Saint Dominic as the Inquisitor. Pope Innocent IV promulgated the bull Ad Extripanda, explicitly authorizing torture and commanded to burn everyone who opposed Catholicism. Here is the salient religious trial of the century. Giordano Bruno, a medieval astronomer, was charged as a heretic by the Catholic Church and burned at the stake. The reason he was burned was that he denied the geocentric theory and insisted on the heliocentric theory. After that, Galilee verified that the Earth revolves around the Sun. But he too was declared a heretic and was forced to recant his heliocentric view. Joan of Arc, maid of Orleans, who saved France from a crisis, was burned at the stake as a witch by the Inquisition. As years went by, the Inquisition helped the Pope exercise his extraterritoriality. To stay in power, the Catholic Church accused those who stood against them of being heretics and eliminated them. If a person was charged of being a heretic once, he had no right to have counsel. He was severely tortured and ended up being in prison for life or executed by fire. The Inquisition was the most infamous and devilish thing in human history. It was devised by the popes and used by them for 500 years to maintain their power. For its record, none of the subsequent lines of holy and infallible popes have ever apologized. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. Historians estimate that in the Middle Ages and early Reformation era, more than 50 million martyrs perished at the hands of the papacy. During the Dark Ages, 50 million innocent people were killed. In order to increase its wealth and power, the Catholic Church killed a great number of people. It is a distortion of history to call a murderer the Apostle of Peace. The Bible describes the crimes of the Catholic Church as below. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. He will speak against the Most High and oppress His saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to Him 
for a time, times, and half a time. The Roman Catholic Church was Babylon the Great that ruthlessly killed innocent people who followed Jesus. The crimes of the Roman Catholic Church, which are prophesied in the Bible, are clearly seen in history. In the Museum of Torture Instruments in San Marino in Europe, the torture devices which were used during the Dark Ages are displayed. Iron Maiden. It is one of the representative torture devices from the medieval period. It is an iron cabinet with a spiked covered interior with iron spikes about eight inches long. When a person is enclosed inside, the whole body is pierced with the pointed iron spikes and is fatally injured. And the person dies slowly from excessive bleeding. The torture device in the shape of a wheel was invented for execution. They tied a person around the wheel, then rolled it repeatedly over fire or spikes. They also bound the four limbs of a person on a wheel and crushed the bones using an iron bar or hammer. Then the person was thoroughly injured and died in pain, still bound to the wheel. The Inquisition invented cruel torture devices to give victims as much pain as possible. A torture device with sharp iron hooks to tear off a living person's skin. A pyramid-shaped torture device with a sharp tip a person was put on top and suffered severe pain as a sharp point was inserted into the body little by little due to the body weight. Most of the time, torches were carried out by Catholic monks or priests. They pulled out nails using pliers, burned parts of the body with fire, and crushed fingers and toes with torture devices. A pulley was used to lift a victim's body up and then drop them to make all the joints go out of place. A person was burned alive while their hands and feet were tied. A chair with spikes was used to tie a person down and it made blood come out from every part of their body. If a victim denied the Catholic Church's teachings, despite the heart torture, they poured boiling lead in the mouth or ears or gouged out their eyes or flogged them until parts of their skin flew off. Sword. Slaying by sword and burning the victims alive. The Catholic priest enforced them to follow their teachings, holding the cross in front of them. Persecution for anti-Catholics continued as a large-scale massacre. In 1209, 6,000 were slain to death at Berthiers. And 1211, 100,000 Christians were massacred at Lavore. Though the massacre at Merendal, 500 women were locked in a room and burned to death. In the massacre of Orange, in 1562, the Italian army sent by Pope Pius IV was commanded to slay men, women, and children. 
in 1572, approximately 100,000 people were massacred in Paris, France. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. As it was prophesied that the one who speaks against the Most High would make war against the saints and conquer them, over 50 million people were slaughtered during the Dark Ages. The cruel massacre of the Catholic Church during the Dark Ages continued to the Holocaust, which killed six million Jews, the most tragic event in human history. From 1933 to 1945, six million Jews, including 1.5 million children, were slaughtered in 15 European countries, such as Poland, Russia, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Romania, Yugoslavia, and Greece. All property of the Jews was confiscated. Women were dragged naked in public. They suffered from starvation, infectious diseases, confinement, and public execution. The Jews who survived faced a miserable death in gas chambers in concentration camps built by the Nazis. When the gates of the concentration camps for the Jews were opened as World War II ended, the world was shocked. In the concentration camps, there were dead bodies of the Jews that were not buried yet, piled up like a mountain. While Hitler massacred six million Jews under the pretext of ethnic cleansing, the Catholic Church publicly advocated Hitler's genocide of the Jews, claiming it stood for anti-Semitism. When the Nazis genocide of the Jews reached its peak, Weissmendel, a Jewish rabbi, sent a letter to the Vatican to ask for help. He begged the Pope to save the innocent Jews, especially young children. 1.5 million out of 6 million Jews who were slaughtered were children. His plea was a desperate outcry. However, the reply he received from the papacy was not just heartless, but blood curdling. There is no such thing as the innocent blood of Jewish children. All Jewish blood is guilty. And the Jews must die. Because that is their punishment for that sin. The Catholic Church was always hostile to the Jews for the reason that they had killed Christ. And they committed countless murders under the pretext that they were punishing the Jews on behalf of God. This kind of attitude of the Catholic Church greatly affected Hitler, who was Catholic. Dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die bolschewische Regierung der Erde und damit der Sieg der Judenumstein 
sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. Hitler was a fervent Catholic. The reason Hitler extremely hated the Jews was from the historical experience of the Catholic Church, which had treated the true Christians and the Jews mercilessly for 1600 years. For this reason, Hitler was able to commit the Holocaust, sending six million Jews to gas chambers without hesitation. Before the massacre of the Jews began, the Catholic Cardinals officiated in mass for blessing the German Nazi guards. And the Catholic Church publicly advertised Hitler's genocide of the Jews. The Catholic Church has committed crimes against humanity for centuries in the name of religion. They committed the crime of killing 50 million Christians and the Holocaust of killing 6 million Jews. The traces of the massacre of the Jews still remain at the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland. The pictures of the Jews and their belongings are displayed in the concentration camp, showing how the Jews were mistreated, cursed, and insulted. These horrible times remain in the records of history. But all the errors of the Catholic Church are disappearing from people's memories little by little. As the 21st century began, the Roman papacy admitted to all kinds of crimes they had committed against humanity for the past 2,000 years of Christian history. They admitted their faults, such as the Crusades, anti-Semitism, the Inquisition, and witch hunts. The Pope also said that the Catholic Church would like to create a new unity among religions by looking back on all their religious errors. However, can all the errors of the Catholic Church be forgiven by just admitting to all the crimes they committed against humanity in the past? Just by admitting to their errors, the Catholic Church's crimes cannot be solved. They can never come to true repentance unless they realize their fundamental errors. When viewed from historical facts and the prophecies of the Bible, the Catholic Church is an organization of the Antichrist, which has destroyed all the truths of God, paganized Christianity by accepting all kinds of pagan gods, and made numerous souls worship Satan, not God. Not being content with their crime of killing cruelly whoever was against them for the past 2,000 years of Christian history, the Catholic Church is still committing a crime 
of driving countless souls to death. Therefore, admitting their crimes, which have already been revealed through history, without having fundamental repentance, is only a crafty trick of the Catholic Church to pull the wool over people's eyes. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. In human history, the organization which has killed the most people is the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, the Pope is called an Apostle of Peace. It is an act to distort history. The reason the Catholic Church is more dangerous than any other organization is that they are doing all these things in the name of Christ. However, now the Catholic Church is revealing its detestable and hideous reality. Uh, in terms of uh, declining congregations, but more profoundly uh, to do with the paedophile uh, sex scandal that has rocked the church uh, for more than uh, 10 years. We've been looking into one particular case involving... Incredible. One of the, one, one former priest said that, you know, perhaps 50% of priests who enter the priesthood may be gay. I talked to a long... This is the living evidence which shows that Babylon the Great is falling apart, being judged by God's wrath as it has been prophesied in the Bible. Fallen. Fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is a Lord God who judges her. God revealed the identity of Babylon through the way she looks outwardly, outward characteristics of Babylon. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. In the Bible, women refers to the church, and among numerous churches in the world, the church that is dressed in purple is the Catholic Church. The color of the traditional priest robe of the Catholic Church is purple and scarlet. We can also confirm that the church that decorates its interior and worship utensils with gold, precious stones and pearls is the Catholic Church. And in addition, it is only the Catholic Church that give mass holding the golden cup true to the words, she held a golden cup in her hand. As we have seen, no church but the Catholic Church satisfies all the points 
that the Bible tells us. The Bible recognizes this organization as Babylon the Great. The Catholic Church Babylon the Great looks as if it worships God, but when we closely look into it, we can find out they do abominable things to worship the sun god. The Roman Catholic Church disguises itself as an angel of light, but it craftily introduced the customs of detestable idolatry and the sun worship of ancient Babylon. So the Bible recognizes it is Babylon the Great. Then does the Bible call only the Roman Catholic Church Babylon? It also calls the Protestant churches which keep the Sunday service and Christmas originated from the sun worship as Babylon too. This title was written on her forehead. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. In the Bible, women refers to church. So, a prostitute means a false church that practices lawlessness. The Bible tells us that Babylon the Great, which is expressed as the mother of prostitutes, is the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches. Small prostitutes that come from the Catholic Church are small Babylons. The Catholic Church which leads the whole world astray as the mother of prostitutes is proud of itself as the mother church that gives birth to all Protestant churches. The Catholic Church is the continuation of the Incarnation and the prolongation in time and space of the Redemption. It is the mother church of all Christendom. The Bible also recorded about the abominable behavior of the prostitute who leads the whole world astray. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Babylon the Great and small Babylons, which changed God's set times and laws, oppressed God's saints. The Bible prophesizes that God's rage will judge them in the end. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Piazza di Spagna, where the movie Roman Holiday was filmed, just below the Spanish Steps, which became famous where Audrey Hepburn ate ice cream, there is a boat-shaped fountain, and we can see that the water is running out of the sculpture of the sun. The head of the boat is embellished with the Pope's coat of arms and the papal tiara. The tiara is the symbol of the papacy. The fact that the tiara is at the head of the boat tells us that the Pope is the very person who leads the sun worship. It is easy to see the tiara in many places of the Catholic Church. There is a secret hidden in the papal tiara. Through this we can also find the identity of the Roman Catholic. The triple tiara is the liturgical crown of the Pope and it has the meaning that the Pope is God who reigns over three worlds, heaven, earth and hell. This is also shown in the official title of the Pope. The official title of the Pope is the Vicarious Philidae in Latin, which means the Vicar of the Son of God. This title shows that the Pope is God himself. Some of the letters of the Latin have numerical values. 
So if we add up the numerical values of the letters of Eucarius Philidae, it is 666. 666. What does that number 666 mean? The Bible records about the identity of 666. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. Every reformer, without exception, spoke of the papacy as the Antichrist. The 666 is a figurative number, telling us the identity of Satan who stands against God. The prophecy of the Bible and the religious reformers with one voice clarifies that 666 and the beast refer to the Pope or the papacy that stands against God. Through the title of the Pope and the respectful treatment he receives, we can confirm again that the papacy stands against God. The Catholic Church calls the Pope God of the Earth. The Pope is a mere man, but the Catholic Church insists that he can modify God's laws as he pleases. And moreover, he is worshipped and served like God, and he enjoys all wealth, honor, and authority. The obelisk standing in the center of St. Peter's Square is closely related to sun worship. It was the custom of the ancient sun worship religions to make a pillar to worship the sun. Obelisk was set up at a temple or tomb as a monument to worship the sun god. It typically had a pyramid-like shape at the top and the pyramid is the emblem of the sun god of the Egyptians, Ra. Like this, the obelisk was made for the sun god. Then, why are the obelisk, the symbol of the sun worship, set up in front of the Catholic churches? When we look carefully at the obelisk standing in front of the Catholic Church, it has the star-shaped divine light and cross, which are symbolized the sun. Just as the obelisk is the symbol of sun worship, the cross on top is also the symbol of sun worship, which originated from Babylon. Crosses are also found in the murals of ancient Babylons and Assyria, especially the image of cross on the headband of the sun god Tammuz shows that the cross is originated in Babylon. The Egyptians used the Ankh cross. The shape of the cross made of two wooden poles which the church started to use came from the ancient Chaldean region. In the Chaldean Empire, the adjacent regions, including Egypt, the cross was used as a symbol of Tammuz. So, it is certain that the cross was made to worship the sun god. The Catholic Church set up obelisks in front of their churches and put the cross on top of them without exception. They put one more symbol on the sun on top of the solar pole obelisk. However, they made an excuse that they put the cross on top of the obelisk to show that they conquered the obelisk which is the symbol of paganism. However, 
The obelisk standing in front of the church as a symbol is nothing but a vestige of idolatry, showing that they accepted the sun worship of pagans. The obelisk, the star shape of the divine light, and the cross are idols for the sun god of the pretense on belief in Jesus. The Pantheon is the oldest monument still standing in Rome. The Pantheon was rebuilt in 125 AD by Emperor Hadrian and dedicated to every known god as well as the sun god, the supreme god of the Romans. Then Pope Boniface IV converted it into a Catholic church. The Pantheon, which once was the temple for the sun god but is now used as a Catholic church, is famous for its domed roof. This domed roof is the figuration of the sky and the universe. In the center of the dome, there is the oculus, a round opening with a diameter of 27 feet. The sunlight from the oculus is reminiscent of the round sun in the sky. The sunlight coming through the oculus lightens the inside of the church and it creates an effect of the presence of the sun in the church. We can find the same round shape in St. Peter's Basilica as well. When we look up at the ceiling of St. Peter's Basilica, there is a circle like the sun at the center and its shape looks like sunlight spreading from the circle. This kind of circular shape can be found not only in St. Peter's Basilica, but on the ceilings of most Catholic churches. Various forms of circle, which embody the sun, prove that the Catholic Church worships the sun. We can find another characteristic of the sun worship in the Catholic Church in their use of lamps and candles. Even in the daytime, they light lamps and candles on the altar. People buy the candles displayed before the statue of Mary, saints and popes, so that they can light the candle, put it on the altar, and pray. When starting the Mass or marching in procession after the Mass, the priest carrying the candle is always at the front. Where does the use of candles in Catholic Church come from? Historian Alexander Hislop says that the use of candles in the Catholic Church comes from pagan rites. The use of these lamps and tapers comes from the same source as all the rest of the papal superstition. For so, according to the established rites of Zoroaster, was the sun god worshipped. In the pagan processions also at Rome, the wax candles largely figured, accompanied by crowds of all sorts that were initiated in the same religion all with flame bow or wax candles in their hands. In the Maluka Islands, wax tapers are used in the worship of Nido, or devil, whom these islanders adore. Catholic scholars also admit that the use of candles in the Catholic Church came from paganism. We need not shrink from admitting that candles, like incense and lustral water, were commonly employed in pagan worship 
and in the rites paid to the dead. We must not forget that most of these adjuncts to worship were not identified with any idolatrous cult in particular. They were common to almost all cults. Candles commonly appear in numerous rites of pagans. And it approves that the use of candles in the Catholic Church comes from sun worship. The Catholic Church conducts a particular ceremony before the image of the sun. Watching their mass, we can find out that it is closely related to sun worship. At the altar that has the image of the sun, the priest lifts up the round bread. They call it elevation and insist that they offer the bread to God. However, offering the round bread which takes after the image of the sun and regarding the round bread as the sun god has existed in the sun worship of paganism. The pillar found in excavations of the Canaanite city of Hazar shows the ceremony of raising the sun disk with both hands in praise. The Egyptians also worshiped the sun lifting the sun up with both their hands. Is it coincidence that the custom of the sun worship of the pagans and the liturgy of the Catholic Church are the same? On special days, they put the bread in the sun-shaped frame and go parade through the streets for public display. The believers all kneel down before the bread to show their respect and adoration. Curiously enough, the monstrance, which is the vessel used to display the consecrated Eucharistic bread, has a sunburst pattern. On the altar where the priest offers the bread, there is also the shape of the sun. By offering the bread in the sunburst pattern, they worship the sun. Around 2800 BC, there lived a hunter named Nimrod in Babylon, which was located between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Whenever wild animals threatened the people, he protected them with his power. As people respected and supported him, Nimrod became arrogant and incited people to build the Tower of Babel. Come, let us build a tower that reaches to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Such deeds of Nimrod that were against God has continued even after Nimrod had died. Semiramis, Nimrod's wife, insisted that Nimrod became the sun god. She cut Nimrod's dead body into pieces and sent them to each tribe of Babylon. People regarded the place where a part of Nimrod was buried as sacred. She also claimed that Nimrod was reincarnated as her son.
the sun god Nimrod was reincarnated as my son Tammuz. He who believes and follows Tammuz follows Nimrod. As Semiramis ruled over Babylon in place of her young son Tammuz, she maneuvered people into worshiping her. Monuments of Semiramis carrying her child Tammuz in her arms were set up all over Babylon, along with various images symbolizing the sun god. The sun worship and the mother-child worship, which was a scheme devised by Semiramis, put down roots as a religion of Babylon. Idolatry stemmed from Babylon spread to many countries after the Tower of Babel collapsed. It is because when the Babylonians were scattered over the whole world, they brought the sun worship and the mother-child worship. The sun worship and the mother-child worship were assimilated into the cultures and religions of many countries and they came to have various forms and names. Nimrod, the sun god, was known as Mithra in Persia, Sol in Rome, Ra or Horus in Egypt, and Apollo in Greece. Semiramis and Tammuz, who were the start of the mother-child worship, was called Isis and Horus, Venus and Dionysus, Diana and Attis, and Astaroth and Tammuz, respectively. Besides these, the image of goddess, who is holding a baby in her arms, was venerated in many countries of the world. If so, was the mother-child worship the creature of an age, which was especially welcomed only in Babylon? Surprisingly, the mother-child worship of Babylon has been passed down through the thousands of years and still exists today. In Vatican of Rome, we can find the mother-child worship in its original state. The statue of Virgin Mary with baby Jesus stands in the eye-catching place in the Catholic Church, whether it is a big cathedral or a chapel in a small town. People show their respect before the picture or statue of Mary and pray. Even the Pope prays before Mary with his head lowered. Why do people praise and worship Mary whom Jesus was born of? A famous Catholic bishop and writer, Alphonsus Liguori, explained in his writings that it is far effective to pray to Mary than to Christ. In the Franciscan Chronicles, it is related that Brother Leo once saw a red ladder, on the summit of which was Jesus Christ, and a white one on top of which was his Most Holy Mother. And he saw some who tried to ascend the red ladder and they mounted a few steps and fell. They tried again and again fell. They were then advised to go and try the white ladder, and by that one they easily ascended. For our Blessed Lady stretched out her hand and helped them so they got safely to heaven. The story which was made by the exuberant imagination sounded plausible. Although it was a man-made story, Pope Gregory XVI canonized Liguori as a saint, and Pope Pius IX declared him a doctor of the Catholic Church.
Now Catholics are taught that it is better to pray to Mary who is merciful and understands us. We must never go to our Lord Jesus except through Mary, using her intercession and good standing with Him. We must never be without her when praying to Jesus. The plausible logic that Jesus cannot refuse Mary's request because she is his mother is shown well even through the image of Mary and baby Jesus. In most cases, Jesus is nested in Mary's arms as a baby. This downgrades Jesus to a little baby who is always dependent on Mary and lets people think that he can do nothing without Mary. Today, the Catholics think more highly of Mary than Jesus. They call Mary the mother of God, which implies that she is above God. Mary as a female is merely a creation who was chosen to conceive Jesus. How ridiculous it is for a creation to be called the mother of God because God used her womb to be born in the earth. Nevertheless, the Catholic Church venerates Mary as the mother of God. Mary worship of the Catholic Church reminds us of the mother-child worship of ancient Babylon. Just as Semiramis artfully spread the mother-child worship throughout Babylon when she ruled it over instead of her son Tammuz, the Catholic Church now makes people worship Mary, not God, by accepting the mother-child worship from Babylon. The Catholic Church regards it a great honor to keep the remains of the popes or saints in the church. Since numerous worshipers pray before the remains of popes or saints, the church that possesses many articles and remains of those who were canonized as saints is highly valued. St. Mark's Basilica in Italy is said to have the remains of Mark. Basilica of San Francesco in Italy has the remains of St. Francesco. And it is believed that the skulls of the wise men who visited baby Jesus are kept in the Cologne Cathedral in Germany. People kiss the displayed relics and the coffins that contain the remains and pray for God's blessings before them. The veneration of relics of the Catholic Church even took the form of decorating the church with human bones. The Church of Santa Maria della Concessione contains the skulls and the skeletons of monks.
Catholic Church in the Czech Republic is designed with the bones of over 40,000 human bodies and it attracts people. The crypt of the Church of St. Francis in Lima, Peru retains the remains of tens of thousands of people. Usually, we shudder to think of the bones and coffins of dead people in the church. But why the Catholic Church sticks to this? You will find that Catholics are encouraged to honor the saints by imitating their holy lives, by asking them to pray to God for us, and by showing respect for their remains, their images, and the like. Why do they say that God grants His blessing through the relics of the dead, especially of those who are called saints? We can find the origin of the doctrine that God gives blessing through the relics in the ancient Babylonian religion. After Nimrod died, Semiramis cut his body into pieces and sent them to other regions and they regarded the place where the dead body part was buried as sacred. The tradition of Babylon was handed down to the Roman Catholic Church and because of this, the relics of the dead have become consecrated. Just like Babylon, that was cursed by God for its idolatry, the Roman Catholic Church is filled with all sorts of idols. In the name of God, the Catholic Church lures many souls into worshipping idols, not God. There are various forms of the sun in St. Peter's Basilica, which is one of the most important buildings of the Catholic Church. The sun disk is around the head of the statue of Peter, and the image of the sun is inscribed above his head. Including the image of the sun glittering with gold in the center of the basilica, we can find various sizes of the sun image beneath the high altar and every spiral column. Even the cross on the altar and the utensils used for communion and the priest's costume have the sun images. In every place of the Catholic Church, we can find the sun images in various sizes and forms. Among the various forms of the sun in the Catholic Church, some has a picture of a dove in it. What relationship is there between the shape of the bird and the sun worship? In the ancient religion of sun worship, the sun god used to be depicted as a bird. 
The sun god depicted as a bird was originated in Egypt and spread to Rome. The son of Assyria was represented as a winged bird and the Egyptian sun god Ra and Horus are in the shape of a bird. The famous Egyptian bird of fire, Phoenix, is also the archetype of sun worship. In Rome, too, people carried the bird, the symbol of the sun god, on the pole. Then why does the high altar in St. Peter's Basilica have the image of the sun with the bird in it? The Catholic Church insists that the bird in the solar image is the Holy Spirit. But this is a mere excuse. When we trace back the customs of sun worship, the bird is the winged sun god that the sun worshippers served. Offering the bread and wine to the image of the bird is not offering them to the Holy Spirit, but to the Sun God. St. Peter's Basilica is located in the Vatican City. The bronze statue of St. Peter always attracts many tourists. People believe that their wishes are realized when they pray by touching the foot of Peter, so the feet of the statue have been worn away. The biggest reason more than 10 million people every year on average visit the Basilica is that they insist that Peter, who was one of the 12 apostles of Jesus, was buried directly below the high altar of the basilica. These are totally unfounded rumors, but people pray for God's blessing before the altar with blind faith. They even teach people that they can have help, even the help they cannot have from God, when they praise and pray in the names of the dead saints. Our most mighty protector graciously assists us from heaven in our struggle with the powers of darkness. And just as you once saved the child Jesus from mortal danger, so now defend God's holy church from the snares of her enemies and from all adversity. Surprisingly enough, hygiolatry also has its origins in Babylon. Since the Babylonians had some 5,000 gods, there were plenty to choose from. Every month and every day of the month was under the protection of a particular divinity. In ancient Babylon, the roles of gods were divided by people's problems and occupations so the people worshipped their certain gods associated with their needs. It has continued in the Catholic Church. The Catholics pray to the certain saints associated with their problems so that they can receive help. Just as we go to see different doctors according to the kinds of diseases, the Catholics go to different saints according to their needs. Just as they downgraded Jesus as a little child who depends on Mary through Mary worship, hagiolatry also deceived people to think that Jesus is weaker than the dead saints so he cannot give them help. Nowhere in the Bible can we find the worship of saints. Instead, the Bible warns that worshiping anything other than God is idolatry.
The Catholic Church even deleted the second commandment of the Ten Commandments so that they can worship the saints. They outbrave the law of God, do not make other gods or serve them, and stand against God. In St. Peter's Square as well, the image of the sun is skillfully hidden. In a round circle of the square, there is a cross with an X through it. It looks exactly like the symbol of the Babylonian sun god Shamish. The Babylonians called the sun god Shamish, and his symbol is the cross with an X through it. So we can easily notice that St. Peter's Square is modeled on the symbol of the Babylonian sun god Shamish. It even has one more circle inside it just like the symbol of Shamish. The Babylonian sun god Shamish also appears in the image of a wheel. The ancient sun worshippers believed that the sun god rides the chariot and they regarded the wheel of the chariot as the sun. To our surprise, St. Peter's Square has the shape of a wheel. The obelisk in the middle of the square is an axle. The square itself is the wheel. We can notice that St. Peter's Square is also the figuration of the sun.